All right, so here we're gonna look at Ginger Baker from his period with Cream. Um, and it, it was a very short-lived period. They, Cream were only together for a few years, but they made a massive impact on music and a big impact on me, because I grew up that. My dad uh, is a bass player and he was, a, he was a teenager when Cream were around, so he was going to all those gigs. And so I grew up with that in the house. So I, I've become a big fan of Cream and Eric Clapton and Ginger Baker, because that's what I grew up with. And uh, around that period, if you're not familiar with it, you had John Mel's Blues Breakers, and that was like a real breeding ground for great blues musicians that then went on to make big waves in rock. So I'll leave that up to you if you want to spend a bit of time on Google checking that history out if you don't already know it. But go and check out. I think if, if, you, if you didn't know this, you'll be uh, pretty amazed at some of the guys that came up through John Mayall's Blues Breaker band and then went off to form or become part of some of those massive bands that we know, one of which was Eric Clapton. And Ginger Baker had an awesome style. He's another one of these guys that grew, came from a jazz background because rock hadn't been invented when he was, you know, when he was learning drums. So he's got this great swing to his playing. And he's also got a lot of those elements of kind of improvisation and just being creative. And one of his biggest improvisations that we know is the drum solo Toad from back in that era. So was John Bonham had Moby Dick, uh, Ginger had Toad. And, and that, and you know, other areas of, of, of Ginger's drumming display his African influence as well. So he had a lot of African kind of tom-tom rhythm stuff as well. And that's why it's so important for us to study different music because the thing of Ginger, he brought in some jazz, he brought in some African rhythms. And if you bring all these little ingredients in from other parts of musical history and parts of the world, what you become is absolutely unique. Whereas if you just listen to one band and just copy that one drummer, you won't be unique. You'll be a bad copy of that drummer. So it's just a, a good, a good, uh, a good uh, representation of why we should study lots of different drummers. And that's what we're doing here. So, sunshine of your love. Everybody, every guitarist learns that riff. Da -da -da -da. Bow, 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 ba -da. The Ginger's approach to this, like a lot of the drummers that we're looking at here, they're not necessarily super technical drummers, but they've just got an interesting approach to drumming. So the beat he came up with here, I remember having to play this in early gigs as a teenager in pubs. And just, I think maybe with my dad actually, some of my early gigs were playing with my dad in pubs. And I just be like, why is the backbeat on beats one and three? So he's hitting the high tom backbeat on one and three, floor tom, um, giving us the eighth note. So we got this sound. Four, ow. Now it's hard to truly hear what the bass drum's doing in these early recordings from this period. Uh, so this is from 1967. But what I think he's doing and what I would play with this, just to give it some beef, is to play the bass on two and two and. And then again in four and four and. So it's one and two and three and four and. So just with the high tom and the bass, we get this. Three, four. All right, now, if I play that up to speed, and I'll, and I'll add in some of his tom fills at the beginning, it's sort of like jigga dig digga do one and two and type things, right? So, That kind of vibe, shigga dig digga dog for those feels. I don't think these these are sort of things. I don't think you really need to learn uh, the song note for note, like the whole way through. I think it's far more important to to get the essence, get the main grooves, get the main feels, and then just learn about the drummer. Try and get inside their head. Think about how they approach the drums, and then you can always improvise the feels, and they're going to sound authentic. They're going to sound close enough because you kind of put your ginger baker hat on 
or your Ringo Starr hat on, or your Mitch Mitchell hat. So you kind of got inside their head, um, almost like an actor. Do you know what I mean? And then so, so then you can play in their style, and you can think about, you know, you could just automatically do their fills, their little variations on the groove. And that's where listening is so important, absorbing it, and like we're doing here, studying those grooves, really getting inside it. And then you're able to just get up at uh, gigs or jam nights or whatever, and just play, and hopefully sound pretty pretty darn close to them. All right. Great song, learn it slow, bring it up. It's not that technical, but just it's a bit back to front. It feels a bit weird. Um, so have fun with that. All right, next up, I want to look at White Room. White Room, man, I love this song. I remember, again, as a teenager, absolutely digging this. Not fully understanding what the heck was going on on the intro, so I learned it by sound. If you've done the same, or if you've heard it and don't have a clue, we're going to break it down. So the thing you've got to understand, if you look right at the beginning of this, the time sync is 5-4. So that's where it throws a lot of people off because the band are just doing that big chord and they're holding that long note with their voice um, and there's nothing really rhythmic in there except for the drums. So the rhythm he's playing there, so we're in 5-4, so it means we've got five quarter notes in a bar. We're playing one, two, triplet, three, four, and five. One, two, triplet, three, four, and five. One, two, triplet, three, four, and five. So it's that fifth beat that often screws people up and the way he's going to orchestrate that or the way he did orchestrate it bass and crash on one and then for the rest of it we'll just play it between two toms all right it says crash two triplet three four and five crash two. it just repeats that so let me just say that i'll count in with five five notes one two three four five Okay, so that was the intro, and we can see on the sheet music here, times eight. So bam, da 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 bam, da 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 And there's eight of those, right? And it's twice around that little chord sequence of four chords twice around. And then on the last one, down, da 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 On the last one, it goes to four, four, and it's crashing bass on beat one again. One, two, three. So big flam on beat three on the snare. And then we're into just a four, four beat, right, a regular beat. And then he's off just playing 4-4 four, four for the rest of the song until is it so, somewhere in the middle it does the intro again. So when you hear that big stop, you've got to get back into 5-4. And that's the groove. So if that ever puzzled you, it's just 5-4. It's not that hard. You've just got to know how to count it. All right, next up, we're going to look at Crossroads. So this is an old bluesy song. Um, and the beat Ginger plays here, I've written out what, you're hearing on the recorded version, right? But if you go and listen to him play it live, even in that era, so this was 1968 on the Wheels of Fire album, which you can see on there. Even in that era, you can hear live recordings and he's playing it different already. Um, you check out the Albert Hall version when they got back together in like 2005 or something, he's playing it different. And if you go and check out Eric Clapton playing it with whoever, Steve Gadd, you, you know, Steve Gadd plays with Eric a lot. Um, They'll play it different again. So ding 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 So you I've I've seen it with Steve just playing a regular beat like ding 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 Regular back beat. Ginger didn't do that on the recording. So we're gonna look at the original recorded version, but as I keep saying, you know, if you're if you're in a situation where you're jamming this or playing it with a band. Don't feel like you've slavishly got to stick to this. Unless you're playing in like a Cream tribute band and you've got the hardcore fans in the audience that have just listened to it every day since 1968 and they, they would know if you change one beat. Uh, unless you're in that situation, just like go with a feel and listen to other versions with Ginger playing it. Go and listen to the likes of Steve Gadd playing it with Eric, you know. If it's good enough for Eric um, to change it up for Steve Gadd, then I don't know, maybe it's cool for you to do it as well. So let's break down what he's doing here. Quarter notes on the snare. So one, two, three, four. Eighth notes on the hi-hat. 
and it's quite a distinctive little open hi-hat on the four and, so that's a nice one to get, so you're going one and two and three and four and. That open hi-hat's important, don't miss that. All right, again, bass drum's quite hard to hear on the recording, but where I'm feeling it, and where I think he plays it, is on the three hand and four hand. That's how I would play this. You might even do one on beat one as well, just to give it more punch on beat one. So let me play that full speed, then I'll break it down. Dun, 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 one, two, three, four. Right, so enough food ginger now. I was doing it sort of a bit on purpose there, but he's a bit random sometimes with his playing. So, you know, little open hi hats in funny places, just it's just feeling it, it's just more groove based, just I don't know, more improv, more creativity, just not feeling like we sometimes do in modern music where it's so clinically perfect. I kind of like that haphazard nature sometimes. Um, but anyway, that, that open hi hat on the forehand is quite a distinctive part. So let's break down the whole thing. So we've played the snare and hi hat already. I'll do that one more time slowly. Three, four. So if we're now just going to add the bass drums in on three and a four and, they come in between those snares. So three and four and. And the four and is with the open hi hat. Like so. Three, four. Last one I want to look at here for Ginger is sitting on top of the world. Um, so this is from their 1969 album, Goodbye. It's a lesser known one, unless you're a bit of a Cream fan. But I want to look at this, because it's in 6-8. So, you know, just through these grooves we're looking at here, we've got 4-4, four, four, we've got 5-4, we've got 6-8. So we're looking at some different time signatures. Now 6-8, we normally feel as two groups of three. One, two, three, four, five, six. And that's no different here. But he's got a slightly interesting hi-hat pattern here. There's loads of variations in the song, but I've just picked out two, just so we can kind of break those down. So the guitars on this bit are going like this riff. One and two and three, four and five and six. And Ginger's following that with a hi-hat. Still the bass and snare on one, two, three, four, five, six. But just the hi-hats following the guitar groove. So it's one and two and three, Four and five and six. I love doing that in a 6-8 groove, just chucking in different hi-hat patterns. It adds so much. So I'm gonna play that more up to speed, but then I'm gonna chuck in some different little groupings on the hi-hat, just so we can see how we can take ideas from these types of drummers, then expand on it. So, uh, I'll do a few bars of what's written here and then I'll maybe play around with it a bit. One, two, three, four, five, six. All right, and then I just finally want to look at another little variation from the same song. And I've written here, it's in the guitar solo, three minutes, 15 seconds. Just so you can locate it. So it's like, the guitars do a slightly different rhythm, more staccato. Dun, dun, gun, ga, gun, 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 ga. The timing is going one and two and three, four and five and six. One and two and three, 
four and five and six. Ginger's playing that with like bass, 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 flam, bass, 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 flam. All right, so I just played those two grooves back to back. That doesn't actually happen in the song. There's loads of other bits between, but just so you can hear how, like Ginger's doing it, he's responding to the music. He's really responding to what Jack Bruce and, and Eric Clapton are playing on the guitars and the vocals and mixing his beat up to make it just sound much more interesting, much more flowing, much more musical than just staying on one groove. I'd recommend going and listening to that song because there's loads of interesting little variations there, all just on the six, eight groove. Um, and you can just chuck those in as variations in your songs or just use them for fill ideas. Or of course, if you're ever playing this song, you'll need them for that. Listening to Ginger Baker on a deeper level is definitely worth it because he's got such an interesting way of playing. As I say, he's brought in those influences from, from jazz and from African rhythm. So, so much to be gained from going and checking out a lot more of Ginger's playing. Mm -hmm.